And, um, you know, she mentions, she's like, you know, you're not up here to fish. I'm like, what? She's like, you're up here to work for free. And it was like, oh shit. I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. Hey guys, I'm Jeremy and today I'll talk about the rest of my experience commercial fishing in Alaska. As I already did in a couple other videos, I had my first season and how I got the job and everything like that. And today I'll talk about my second and third season up in Sandpoint. And I'll finish off one more story of uh, my Dungeness crab experience. So after I finished purse sanding and gill netting for the season, I figured I'd try to get one more job. And I'd seen this guy on the Robin needed one crew member. And this was a pretty unusual circumstance because he had just lost two crew members. One got killed with an ax. <laughs> I'm not even joking. The kid went to his uh, either his hometown or when they were in port. I think that was uh, not in Sandpoint. He was in either King Salmon or one of the other towns. I forget the name now. And I think he hooked up with someone's wife. Uh, and it wasn't his wife. <laughs> so yeah, tragic ending for that guy. And then the other crew member was a young woman who he had been dating a bit. So this girl just left him and he already lost the other crew member under insane circumstances. And he was quite the hefty drinker. Uh, and so when I get on the boat, I'm like, oh boy, this is gonna be a pretty interesting experience. So he took me on the boat and then another local kid named AJ, who's from Sandpoint. And we got all the pots and everything ready for this Dungeness crab fish. It was just gonna be, you know, a few days or whatever. So first I'll explain what is Dungeness crab fishing so you kind of have some idea. Um, if you've seen the deadliest catch you've seen, usually they're going for king crab. So they have those huge cages, which are you know almost the size of a person basically. And you cut up a bunch of bait and you put it in that pod or that cage, whatever. You dump it down in the ocean for a few days and then you pull it up. So with Dungeness crab fishing, you have the same idea, okay? They're, they're smaller crabs, usually they're about this big. Um, but you're gonna use a smaller uh, cage or a pot, they call. So they're only about the size of like a, a truck tire or something like that. So anyway, a few days before that, you'll cut up all the bait and throw all of these, you know, cages or pods in the water throughout like a bay, for instance, okay? And that's what he had did before we went on this trip, like a week before, a few days before. So then when we get out there, uh, you can see where all of the pods are located because you can see little like buoys, little floating device in the water. So you can see where to throw this kind of hook device or something. And then you would attach that to a hydraulic thing and that wraps and that brings in the uh, pot. So we headed out there, which was, I don't know, six or eight hours to this mainland, this bay uh, that we went to and we anchored up. And then the next day it was uh, really windy and stuff. And uh, although we were in the bay, so it didn't really matter too much, but you know, he's kind of like pointing, he's like, oh, look at this, the, the white caps or whatever, meaning that like there's all these waves or something like that. And actually it was like, I don't think it was really bad. So I don't know if this was a hangover day or a drink day or whatever. But anyway, we didn't fish that first day. So um, he had passed out at some point, like in the afternoon. So me and AJ took the liberty of taking out the skiff. And generally speaking, these, these huge skiffs are more like a tank. They're, they have a huge amount of power to be able to, you know, pull these enormous nets and all this fish around. But they're not really fast. You know, they only go, go like 15 kilometers an hour or something. And so this skip, for whatever reason, it was actually pretty fast. You know, it meant maybe 35 or something miles per hour or whatever. So uh, me and AJ, we were like, you know, we had a few drinks or whatever. And so we uh, drove over to the uh, mainland and we uh, got out near the beach, right? And I think that was our first mistake because I don't think we had it tied up right. Or like, you know, the tide's constantly changing so it could either get washed out or stuck on the beach and stuff. It's huge, obviously. And so we went up to this uh, local guy's house. There's only one local in this like little village where maybe only uh, a dozen people live part of the year. And he was smoking salmon and stuff like that. So we're kind of hanging out in that guy's house, had a few drinks. And as some people know, some of the natives don't handle their booze too well. And so, you know, AJ was pretty ripped and so was that guy. And uh, I, I was definitely, you know, drunk, but you know, I could still handle uh, what was going on. And so the first issue was, I think we couldn't really get the skiff back in the water that easily because the tide had lowered a bit. So that was the first issue. And eventually we got out there and 
like I mentioned, the skiff was going, could go pretty fast, like up to like 35, which is rare for those kind of skiffs. And he's just like, whoa, yeah, let's go. Just going as fast as he can, circle, turn around, doing all this kind of stuff. You know, we're hitting areas where you can tell that it's too shallow, so we're hitting the bottom or some, you know, kelp or different things in the water. And uh, eventually we, uh, we got back to the boat. You know, it's kind of like chill out. You know, we gotta um, relax. We don't want to get too crazy or you know mess up the skiff or something like that. So eventually, we got back to the boat. The skipper was real pissed and everything like that. And uh, you know, of course, there's no cook on the boat. Obviously, it's either me or him. You know, the the skipper's not gonna cook or whatever. And the funny part about this is that before that girl quit, that he was like dating basically. They already mentioned they were looking for a crew member like a week or two before that. And so she made some flyers. She, you know, she's really artistic and it was like, come fish with us, home cooked meals and this really nice hippie vibe, this kind of thing. And so AJ's really drunk and he's, you know, wants a meal or whatever. We just, we ended up just eating Dungeness crab or whatever. And so AJ eventually brings up this reference. He's like, what about the uh, home cooked meals? I thought we were going to get a home cooked meals. And he's all drunk, acting just like a five year old. It was so funny. And the skipper's just like, shut the fuck up, AJ. Go to bed. Go to bed, AJ. Shut the fuck up. Over and over. So I guess finally he passed out or whatever. So we got up and we started pulling pots in the morning. It was okay. So I, I tried doing that first. I wasn't too good at throwing that hook. And uh, AJ's been doing it for a while. He's a local guy. So he, he was doing that job. I was running the hydraulics and stuff for a while. And, you know, throughout part of the day, it was going okay. Some of the pots had crab. Some of them didn't. And he didn't want to use the refrigeration because usually you put fish or crab or whatever in the fish hold and you turn on the refrigerator to keep them preserved. And he didn't want to turn on the refrigeration because, you know, it burns more energy and stuff. So we just used like one of those big king crab cages or something even bigger and you just keep those in the water so you'll keep them on deck you'll maybe put them inside and then afterwards you'll throw them overboard and keep them in the water for a day or two so they're alive and then you pull that up when you leave we'll take them all back to sandpoint and deliver them to the cannery so in the bay there's probably i don't know a hundred different pots so there's a hundred different little buoys that you drive around and you know you pick them up some of them will be empty some of them will be full. And some of the, those we've already gotten before, okay? And this key point, right? Because as I mentioned, the guy was a big boozer. So, you know, he's pounding back beers for part of the day. And we eventually get to this point where it's kind of like, we got one and then he turned and went around and we were like, oh, we just got that one. And uh, we were like, oh, we just got that one. And he's like, no, no, let's go. And, and so we just kind of went, we're like, whatever. I'm not gonna get in a big argument at first. And then like, it started just happening over and over. Like we were just going back to the same ones we were, had already gotten. And uh, so he's pissed off cause he's boozing and he's, he's kind of like, uh, he was about, I don't know, middle age, 45 years old, and kind of a Napoleon guy. You know, he's only about, you know, five, four or something like that, big tempered. Of course that girl had just left him. And uh, he mentioned he had big problems with his son or something. And you know, I'm sure it's just typical things that a lot of drunks have issues with, right? And so it was funny, AJ too had a really quiet voice. So he'd be like, we already got that pat. It was really funny how like he's yelling, but actually you couldn't even hear more than two feet. So I was trying to mention it. And um, you know, I was like, ah, blah, fuck this. And so we're just kind of like doing whatever. And there was some point it was funny because some of the time when you're pulling up the, the pot or something, you have an issue. So like maybe you'll, uh, you'll use a, a different like hook with a rope and use a hydraulic to pull that out of the water. Well, there was something where like, you know, the hook got wrapped around another line that was above us. And we were taking our time trying to get it. And he did this to pull and he's like, oh, I'll just go and take care of it real quick. And he kind of like jumped up. I want to say maybe he jumped up and put his legs or did something to go get it. And you just saw the hook, which, you know, this thing is a big metal thing that probably weighs, you know, like a half a pound or something like that. It's not light and just slow motion. <laughs> smashed his teeth, it chipped his teeth. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we were kind of like, there you go, dumbass. You know, we were, he was already not going to the right pots, this and that. And so after he smashed his teeth, it was like, he's pissed. And he's like, we're going back, you know? And I noticed he was out of beer. You know, I looked up there, I was like, oh, he's out of beer. So that's why we're going back. So yeah, the skipper just like left all our huge pots in the ocean. And we were like, what the fuck, dude? We have all this stuff. And he just is going. So, you know, we could have made uh, seven, $800, probably only made 300 bucks because of that. 
So yeah, we heart started heading back uh, towards town. It was already late in the day, so it was going to be nighttime and you know a couple hours or whatever. And so the skipper passed out. So he asked AJ to take wheel watch. And then, you know, he was there for not even a half hour before he asked me to come up. And then he went straight to bed. He didn't, you know, it's such a joke. And so I just kept going. I knew where we were going. I could see the radar. We had, you know, a good six hours to town or whatever. And the stuff in the back wasn't tied down. And, you know, there was some not real heavy weather, but I mean, it was, it was rocky for sure. And I'd been used to it by then, so I didn't think much of it. And all the stuff in the back's kind of banging around and stuff. I was like, ah, whatever, you know? I mean, we, we didn't even get all the crabs, so it's like, who gives a shit, right? And eventually the skipper comes up and I'm like, you know, he's looking around all panicky. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. And he's like, it's not fucking okay. <laughs> he's freaking out. He's like, you know, all this stuff is all over the place. So he, I go out in like my, you know, my t-shirt and stuff and just tie all this stuff down or whatever for a few minutes. Eventually there was a tiny island uh, basically a rock and we just anchored there for the night and then we went back the next day and so the next day I went to the uh, Harbor Cafe and I was beginning to tell her the story and I was like we would have done really well and she interrupted me and said if he wasn't drunk <laughs> so it's kind of like yeah I should should have known if this was gonna happen right so that season ended completely of course I was looking for different networking options for my next fishing job the next year right because I had worked on those two boats, which were all right, but I definitely wanted to up my game if possible. Of course, my first choice was working on the Sea King with the original guys I met in Homer, and they were probably going to be crewed up. So I figured I'd try to like you know meet some other guys. So I got some phone numbers and stuff. And one of the nicest guys I met in town uh, was on this one boat, uh, Northern Dawn, and his name was Jack, nicest guy in the world, and always, oh, if you need something, let me know. Yeah, give me a call, and uh, you know this winter and next spring, and. And so anyway, long story short, I ended up getting that job. Now, the bad thing I heard about uh, working with him is that he always wanted people to come up way early. And a lot of people, um, you know, had to do extra jobs. Like they clean out his house or do like a lot of extra work, not just fishing, you know, or some basic work on the boat. And this was the case. I came up five weeks early. We took out the reduction gear. We painted, you know, we redid, we repainted the build. So you had to take a needle gun, you know, it's steel boat which has more work than fiberglass usually. So we had to do all this extra stuff for five weeks. And then uh, me and the other guys, we started fishing, you know, like a regular season. And for those of you guys who have fished a lot, you know, I mean, you could go out to like an area near town where everyone else goes and you could go in turns. So you actually only go fishing like a few times a day. And if it's a good spot, I mean, it's okay because you could still make, you know, you still catch, I don't know, let's say 10, 20,000 pounds, you know? Or you could just go off on your own far away and maybe there's a little less fish, but if you keep grinding all day, like 50, you know, you could get 15 or 20 different sets in and that would always be more, uh, generally speaking. So he was kind of doing sort of like the mediocre way of catching fish. I think back in his day, the guy was, you know, really ambitious and went off on his own and was just banging it out and stuff. And, you know, maybe at this point he's probably, you know, uh, around 50-ish or so. Maybe he didn't need the money. He didn't have kids. Um, he was married, uh, ironically, to his cousin, I think. <laughs> yeah, small town, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, he didn't really, you know, need a ton of money. So it was like, we're out there to make money. And I'm not going to change this guy's behavior or whatever. And so, yeah, June was kind of mediocre. And uh, we didn't have too many sets or anything. We did a lot of work in town. As I mentioned before, the first week in July, no one fishes because uh, you know the government closes it down so the fish can get through and whatever. And so a lot, you know, some people do boat work, but most of the people have a few days off or almost a week off. It's 4th of July and stuff. And we're just out there sewing the net and just doing stuff. He kept us busy every day. We hadn't even made any money, right? We had spent our money to get there, did all this, and he didn't even give us any time off. So right there, we weren't too happy with that. And, um, you know, the rest of the season, you know, a few more trips went on. And I remember I was up at the uh, Sandpoint Tavern talking to one of the women at the, uh, who worked at the cannery. And, um, you know, she mentions, she's like, you know, you're not up here to fish. I'm like, what? She's like, you're up here to work for free. And it was like, oh shit. I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. Come up here, do all this free work on his boat. Then he goes out, doesn't really give a shit if he catches anything. 
Yeah, I got nothing for that season, basically. You know, I went back home and uh, yeah, he was really, and he really turned out to be a, not just an asshole in that regard, but just a total dick. You know, because even on the uh, those days uh, in July that we would have had off that were sitting there sewing the net, I kind of mentioned something like, oh, maybe we could go off, kind of do this. And at some point, I don't know exactly the context, but it was kind of like, I guess I'll just have to go back to Buffalo and make some money in winter. Like, totally didn't give a shit that, like, he had totally taken advantage of the situation. So that was really weird to me, because he, he was like, face-to-face -face conversation was one of the nice guys you could meet. Um, but the actions to have people go up there and work for free or like barely make anything, uh, horrible, horrible stuff. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, can happen. So that's how my crab fishing and second season, uh, purse sanding went in, uh, Sandpoint, Alaska. Um, obviously you can see things don't always work out, you know, it's a, uh, it's a big gamble and you never know how it's going to turn out. And so I'll make one more video for my third season and some of my thoughts on the whole experience. So you can check that out. Uh, I'll put that out in a couple days. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe if it was helpful. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.